and uh, Rolfson, a researcher at the uh, University. And uh, I will uh, present some results from the uh, yeah, remote sensing, mostly of the bucket damage. And it's a project financed by the Swedish Natural Space Agency that has been running since 21 and is more or less ending now. And I will talk a bit about risk mapping, the continuation of the work Mitri has presented, and then a bit about time series of sensor two data for fault beat and attack detection. And then we'll work a bit with time series of variability for fault beat and detection and uh, time series of random forest models where we put the piece, pieces together. But a lot of the time series things. But first, uh, risk mapping. We extended uh, the study that Nitro did with geographically weighted methods. And so the data are the same that Nitro presented, and it's the same as study happening. But then uh, we were studying uh, correlations and straight in water correlation with the uh, Moraine's high statistics is a way of uh, getting an idea of the space, <laughs> space and water correlation. And then uh, we tested with geographically weighted regression, which is a regression where you give, you have <laughs> the features, but then you give a weight based on distance with geographically weighted. And that also gave some indication of where we have more homogeneous areas or where the spatial collation was larger. And then we performed spatially constrained clustering. And then we got uh, different areas that were somewhat homogeneous. So, and uh, I'm used to walking around, but <laughs> it was too long. So we were training random forest models and uh, interpreting feature importance. So we were training one global model. It was the same area that Mito was talking about, with, but we trained this new global model in this case. And then we split the entire area into two areas and trained global or trained one random forest model for each. And then we did the same with four areas and with eight areas to train local random forest models to see if there were differences in feature importance between the areas. Um, this is just two examples uh, from a normal year and drought year, as for Nitro, and uh, with four areas. So for the normal year and the drought year, it's not the same areas because we check for each year uh, the spatial autocorrelation. Uh, for the normal year with four areas, we get two quite large areas and then two small areas. For the drought year, we get one large area and three small areas. And uh, the area around here, we put the, on the map, it's for both years, it's a quite small area for some reason. I will not uh, get into much of the results here. There will be too many figures, but that one example with the drought period where we have four areas and we have the global model. And here we include the <coughs> five most important features. And uh, canopy heights, most important as in Mito's paper. The West Coast volume, second soil wetness, Basal area and the digital elevation model. And then in the table below, we have the, the four areas and the five most important features. And canopy height was uh, most important in area one. And one thing to think about here is the number of points in area. So area one is the large area. Uh, most of the data. In area four, we also have quite a lot of data. 
then areas two and three, it's less stable. But ten of the height, most importantly one, or second, most important in area four, the fifth more most important in area three, and it was not one of the five most important in area two. But uh, it's proof volume was second, it was number two in uh, area one, in area two it was the most important, and then uh, was included as uh, third most important area four. Um, like soil wetness was number three in the global model, it was number two in area one, the large area, it was not one of the five most important area two, uh, not in area four also, and <clears throat> was number four in area three. Uh, so the way to study if we can have one global model that cover the entire area, or if we should mo have models for smaller areas, so how can we identify the smaller regions and uh, how does feature importance vary in those areas? So when we get smaller areas, then we get less, re <coughs> less reliable results. But this is something we submitted one article and we tried to get funding to extend to a larger area because we have the harvest data for a much larger area. And if the area is larger, then it's getting more interesting to split it into smaller areas. So to actually study how much uh, the feature importance differs and then get into more understanding why do those differ in the areas. Uh, uh, and, uh, next study is <coughs> time series analysis, pixel based. We call it examining the potential for early detection of school spot people because the method supplied cannot be used for near real-time detection, but it's like to see what is the potential for early detection. So we worked with uh, Sentinel-2 data. We processed the data with force, because then we can do image-to-image -image co registration Because we're working with data 2017 to 2019, when there were still a problem with the geometric alignment between uh, satellites, uh, Sentinel 2A and B. So that's handled with force. And then we worked with the 10 meter pixels, the grid that Metro was preparing. So all uh, 20 meter dams were resampled to 10 meter with nearest neighbor or simply splitting into four pixels. Then, we work with four vegetation indices, NDVI, NDWI, CCI, and NDRS. And for NDRS, we normalized with the entire study. And then we were smoothing the data with a software package called TimeSat. Last year, it was presenting uh, if it's, um, you had <coughs> the last or the least. The previous research meeting. And so with time set, we're fitting a function to the raw data to handle noise and smooth the data. And then we can extract phenology parameters. But in this case, we have want to smooth the data. So looking at the figure, we have the blue curve, that's the raw data. This is not actually data we are working with, this is just an illustration of how time out works. And then the red curve, that is the fitted uh, function in uh, time set. So we have the raw data, we fit the function in time set, and then we are working with the fitted smoother data where we have much less noise. Uh, but that means we cannot work in near real-time situation because time up needs uh, data from the entire season to actually fit the function. And we use the uh, DL spline, which is a combination of double logistic function and 
supply. So this is uh, <coughs> how it looks for the four vegetation indices. Uh, to the left, that's uh, with gray lines, which is yes, this is a mess when looking at that. The times up uh, smoothed the uh, uh, function for all uh, the pixels. And uh, with black, that's the mean of all the pixels. Uh, which gives a better indication of the log era 2017, so before uh, the rock meter outbreak, then uh, the vertical green dashed line. That is uh, the spring's warming in May. And spring's warming is derived from uh, pheromone traps that the Swedish Forest Agency have available. And uh, for 2018, it was very distinct peak, the second week of May, and then low activity for the rest of the season. So it was a very distinct main swarming second week of May. And uh, the dotted red line, that's September 2018, just to give an indication of where the end of the growing season is. And then uh, the dashed, dashed uh, gray line, that is when the trees were harvested in uh, April 2019. Mm -hmm. So we had the smoothie time series with the four vegetation indices. Then uh, we calculated a one year difference from uh, 2017 to 2018, and that's what we have to the right. And uh, since uh, the data are smoothed, then we have data for all days, so to say, so we can just get a difference in this one year. And again, gray is the pixel, and then black is the mean. And then we are continuing working with the one year difference. And then we were applying different methods for change detection and algorithms. And we use the NDRS data in this illustration. So to the left, you have the one year time difference of NDRS and the the red box marks year 2018. And that's what we have uh, with different change detection methods. So the top method is called the best detecting breakpoints and estimating segments in plan. So it's a method that creates segments of the time series and then fit a trend to that segment and then detects when there is a change in the trend. So if there is and then uh, we can set a threshold to detect a, a black change when you, based on the magnitude of the thread. And that's the red dot. So that's a break, the trend is changed. And that is detected as the strongest break in this case. So this is when something is happening. So this is how early we can detect the outbreak in this method. Then the middle method is mean level shift. It detects when uh, there is a shift in mean level of a time series. And that's, since it detects a shift, it finds it a bit later than uh, when the trend was actually changing. And then we also calculated cumulative sums. And there you have like a baseline, which should be on zero, and then you have an upper and a lower limit. And uh, 
you calculate a cumulative sum from the baseline, as a deviation from the baseline, and when it reaches above or below the limits, then it detects a change. Well, um, the result from this one, we have uh, the flux of x, that's the mean value, and uh, dash is the media. And this is for each pixel when uh, we had detected <coughs> a change or when at the earliest we could detect the outbreak. And the solid is the with the best, the dashed icons that's with the mean level shift and the hashed area that is, <coughs> that's with cumulative sound. And green for NDI, blue for NDWI, gray for CCI, and red for NDRS. Um, the best performs that looks much smaller spread with and uh, yeah, it's, we can read a bit in like hiding structure. So with CCI we detected uh, after 31 days and the RS after 33 days and the I after 39 days and the WI after 40 days mean of all the people with the best. But again, as I told, we cannot use this as a near real time. Both because it's new to the data and also because the best needs to have the future data so to say to fit the trend. Uh, so for near real time other methods are required and then probably Fusion would be more suitable because then it's made for near real time monitoring of processes in industry. In my PhD, I applied to some accumulated sums for near real time detection of insect outbreaks. Then it was birch moth in North Sweden with modus pixels, so very different data. But probably to it a better way forward for near real time, but this gives an indication of how early we can detect the data. So with DCI, um, like 31 days after the main swarming. Then we've been working with in between pixel variability. The okay. assumption that if you have some scattered trees in a window of pixel, the variability between those pixels will change. So even if we cannot see a change in the pixel value, the variability in a window of pixel will change. And this is uh, two master students we're working with. So we have still the same data, but now limited to a smaller study area. We have the same data processed in force, the same vegetation indices as before. And then we calculated coefficient of variation. And coefficient of variation is simply a standard deviation divided with the mean. Uh, we did that with uh, window sizes, three by three, four by four, um, five by five pixels. Uh, we only included windows where all the pixels in the window had the same land cover. Uh, because otherwise it would be phenology or other differences that influence the variability. So that means we get a bit limited how many pixels we can actually work with. And we also calculated the number of trees in a window, call it attack intensity. So in this case, we have four pixels with attack tree. We calculate the sum, so in this case, we would have 18 uh, attack trees at attack intensity. Um, the result is a bit messy. We have a gray line as attack and a gray death as healthy window. Then we have the four uh, vegetation indices. We have mean uh, coefficient of variation on the y axis, and that's the mean PV of all uh, pixels 
to all windows. And then we have time series of two data on the extra. Uh, and it's a bit noisy, the raw, so we have smoothed. Yeah, so black solid that's smoothed uh, for attacked pixels, and the black dash that's for the health. And we used a rolling median of five time periods for smoothing. If looking at the CCI, right now, the healthy, the position of variation state quite stable during the ISR, but for the attack, then uh, sometimes late May, early June, it seems to be an increasing plant. So things to thought to be a difference between the healthy and the attack, but a bit of the increase for the attack. For NVDI, there's also been increasing for the attack, but not that much. And then later in the season, it increased for both attack and healthy. For NVDI, it's not easy to get too much from it. It stays a bit stable for the attack, um, dropping for uh, their healthy. And then also for NDRS, it stays quite stable during the summer. It's not until some week into July. That's the, and here uh, for CCI and NDRI, if our 10 meter pixel, we have more pixels working with NDWI and NDRF. It's originally, if we have a four by four pixel, it's only two by two pixels. So that's one difference between CTI and VI and NDWI and the RS. But there seems to be something with a variability that can interpret. We check the uh, attack intensity, number of attacks. Here, green is the mean for all the healthy. Black is the mean when we include all windows with attacks. Then, uh, the dash gray is if we have 16 or more trees in the window. Um, the gray yes, solid line is we have eight or less trees in the window. Um, by variability is increasing more and higher when we have eight or less. And if we have 16 or more, then that's the lowest change of variability, which Makes sense because if a, a larger number of trees, then the pixel value will change for more pixels in the window, and then the variability will not increase. But hopefully, that will be caught by the difference. Uh, we also check window size. We have a black for five by five window, blue for four by four window, and gray for three by three window. And solid for attack, a uh, uh, dash for healthy as before. And it's not that much difference between the window. Uh, so, but one big difference is if we're only having windows with the same land cover, that we will have much more windows if we work with three by three size instead of five by five. Uh, so, we made a test when we applied. The best again the change detector. We trend to see how early we could detect something. Um, but NDI in green and DWI in blue, then CCI in yellowish and NDRF in red. Uh, um, the black line again is the best trends and where we detect it. So NDI. Detected in 14th of June, NDWI 23rd of June, CCI 3rd of June, and NDRS 25th of June. The trend uh, or a change in trend. So that indication how early something could be detected with the variability. Mm -hmm. But again, we are applying a rolling median of five, so it's not directly interpretable as something near real time, but the indication that variability between pixels can 
interesting to look at when uh, detecting uh, and attack trees. And then we have uh, one uh, study where we are combining the pieces. We're creating time series of random forest models. And the random forest models is to classify into healthy and attack pixels. And again, it's the same data. But here we're working with two tiles only. That's the two tiles where we have the largest amount of data. And um, we wanted to study if there was a change in detection actual accuracy with time. We were estimating that with time after swarming, accuracy would increase. So we wanted the, the random forest model to be influenced only by time, not the spatial domain. So then we were uh, training separate model for tile A and tile B, and we only included data when there were at least 90% of the pixels <clears throat> with no cloud. Otherwise it could be we have clouds in the south area, then we only get data from the north area. And the next day, maybe there are clouds in the north and we only get data from the south area. And then the spatial differences will be included. We want only the temporal. Then we compare the accuracy when we had only single data center two data and temporal data. And temporal data is in this case also one year difference. And then we include the spatial variability in this case, we have the spatial variability of the difference between a pixel and the center pixel square. And then we take the sum and the square roots. So not the coefficient of variability. Uh, and then we study which wavelength bands that are more important. Um, so there we have random forest model with single date only with one year difference only, then where we combine single date and one year difference. And variability we have in all models. And then the random forest model where we included single date, temporal difference, and uh, the risk map. Um, here are for the two tiles, tile A and tile B, for accuracy on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis. And uh, the two Dash lines, that is the week of main swarming from the pheromone traps. And uh, yeah, its accuracy is high already in 2017 before the outbreak. And it's not something obviously ha happening after the outbreak. But I mean, the latest, latest sufficient data is July 7 and August 7. So. Uh, so it's uh, like other studies also found that it's quite a lot related to the risk of being attacked that we can detect. So then, then the two data seems quite much the same thing as the uh, bulk beetle see the trees that are easy to attack. Then uh, we combine the models. Now we have the temporal compound, so then we cannot have the 17 data, so now it's only for 18. And again, the red dash is when uh, the bulk beetle was warming. So the temporal and the single date model gives similar results. Then accuracy increase when we combine them. So there's some information from the temporal and some uh, from the single date. And then we include the risk map, um, tile A, where we have a bit lower accuracy, accuracy in the increase when we have the risk map included. For uh, tile B, there's a very low increase in uh, accuracy, but a slight increase when we include the risk map in the models. Uh, and again, that's and it's quite early in this case. And now when we have the one year difference, it's July 6th for tile A, but for tile B, it's the uh, 8th of June, the last day to data. So hopefully accuracy will increase if we have data for later. But since we wanted only 
time steps where we had at least 90% done. That's the limitation. Then uh, we looked a bit at feature importance. So we have uh, the top image that's accuracy and time as before. And uh, then selected four dates for the feature importance. Uh, the time series where there is a small peak in accuracy, in those cases, the blue band is the dominating band. So, and that's something that was the distance. For tile A also, I just selected two here to avoid too many figures. So seems like the blue band is important. But it's the most important band where we have a bit higher accuracy. And some other studies found the blue band, but many found the blue band is not that important. So I need that to be something because the blue band is the most sensitive to scattering and noise in the atmosphere if it's related to it. There is information, but most of the time we cannot see it due to atmospheric disturbances in the data. And that's just a guess. Uh, and then uh, the three bands, when we have uh, three bands, on uh, June 8th, June 28th, and then in July. Generally, the wheel bands were the most important band. Uh, like we had two, three weeks and later after the swarming. So that gives an indication that uh, like after swarming, wheel bands are more important. So they probably catch a bit of the signal from the attack since they are less important before the attack. And uh, for variability, it had low influence on accuracy. What we see uh, when the variability was important, it was the variability of the green band that was the more important. And these are uh, just around swarming and just after swarming. So if the variability is related to a weekend tree or swarming or forest structures, how to say but. The green band was the more important variability features. Um, in these two cases, it was the most important feature. Yeah, that's all I had to say.